Hello and welcome to this session then on uh, building open organizations. Uh, in the next 15 minutes, you will learn what that means, the resources available, how to find them, how to use them, and more importantly, how to contribute to them. I am Jimmy Sjölund, and I'm an open organization ambassador and also working as a lean and agile coach at Telia Company based in Sweden. And now over to Brian, the other speaker. Hey, thanks, Jimmy. Uh, I'm Brian Berenshausen. I am a community architect in the open source program office at Red Hat. Um, Red Hat sponsors the open organization project and community, as you will learn in just a few minutes. And um, I've personally been supporting the project since 2015. Uh, and in fact, I think that's a good place for us to start, uh, just to give you a little bit of a history of our project so you can see how best you can contribute. Um, I'll take us back to 2015 and provide a little bit of that, uh, little bit of that context. Um, in, the, in the very beginning, uh, there was a book, uh, or rather, I guess I should say there was an organization, and that organization was, is Red Hat. Uh, and Jim Whitehurst, who was then the CEO of Red Hat, wrote a book about it. And that book is The Open Organization Igniting Passion and Performance. And that book was released uh, by Harvard Business Review Press in 2015. And, and the book really describes how principles uh, like transparency, authenticity, meritocracy, right? Uh, in short, like, you know, these principles that we associate with openness really could spin out of open source communities or could, could form the foundation uh, of organizations, uh, business organizations or any organization, nonprofits, uh, in, in the face of changing uh, work conditions and, and changing lives, uh, right? How can uh, the same principles and practices that power some of the world's most innovative communities, open source communities, how can they be the bedrock of uh, organizational culture in any context, right? Um, and that book was released in uh, 2015, as I said. Uh, and in the epilogue of that book, uh, Jim Whitehurst issued uh, an invitation uh, to anyone reading. He said, you know, go and share your thoughts and opinions on a certain page uh, situated on opensource.com, which is a place uh, that I recommend you check out if you're not familiar with opensource.com. I've worked on opensource.com since 2010 at Red Hat. Uh, and so people did, you know, reading Jim's book, they went to opensource.com to continue the conversation about the ways that open principles uh, are changing the way we work and we manage and we lead today, right? The way we build organizational cultures. Uh, and eventually that conversation outgrew a single book about a single company, right? One book about Red Hat uh, and participation in the community kept increasing. Uh, and we began creating content in the form of books, articles, uh, definitions, all, all different kinds of things, which you'll learn about today, um, all designed to really con continue the conversation that the open organization started, um, exploring how open is it, uh, organizations of all kinds could become more open, and, and ultimately um, an upstream community formed around the ideas in this book, right? An open source project really focused on exploring open principles at work in organizations all over the world. Um, Red Hat continues to support that community, uh, providing critical funding uh, and infrastructure for the project and the conversation that it continues to foster. So um, that upstream community continues, continues to do some fantastic work today, uh, and it's still growing. Uh, we are an upstream knowledge sharing community committed to exploring how open principles change the ways we work, manage, and lead. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what that involves with the rest of our time today. Um, according to our most recent uh, community survey and audience survey, um, these are the most common ways that participants identify themselves, right? IT architect, developer. Uh, but you will also see some other uh, identifications here that I think are really interesting in our community makeup, right? People managers, right? CEOs and project leads, right? Folks that are interested in the people and process side of open source. You might even say the uh, the people of open source, right? Um, the uh, the folks that are interested in the ways open principles can be leveraged to tackle um, people and process issues in organizations, not just technical ones. Um, and as the community continued to grow, right? As uh, we just learned in our previous presentation, you're always going to have a sort of core contributor group, right? And our core group of core contributors are called the open organization ambassadors. These are folks that have uh, demonstrated routine 
uh, stellar commitments to the community, helping uh, set the direction for the project uh, in a post book world, right? And continue to establish it, its priorities, set its agenda, et cetera. Um, the people become ambassadors in all sorts of ways, but everyone joins the group by demonstrating that kind of, you know, sustained valuable commitments to the group, whether it's writing, speaking, maintaining resources, recruiting other people to the community, uh, and so on. Um, and, and one of those folks uh, is my partner today, Jimmy Schulen, uh, who is an open organization ambassador, has been working in the community for a long time. So I'd like to turn it over to him uh, to tell you a little bit more about the community itself, uh, how we work, what he has gotten out of uh, participating, and some of the resources that, that we've created. So Jimmy, I'll hand it back over to you. Yeah, so that was a bit about the community. And like I said, we operate like many other upstream open source communities, as you will see. But we are largely a non-technical group. Uh, we create and share knowledge in, uh, as others communities create and share code. So, but what does that mean exactly? What does it look like? So let's take a look at some of the resources that we've been saying. The first one is foundational. After all, we're the open organization community. But what do we mean when we talk about open organizations? What do others mean? As the community formed, the ambassador huddled together and created the open organization definition from the discussions and material available, including our own research and interviews with leaders across the world. The definition, as everything else, is open for all to suggest changes and amendments. And what the ambassadors identified was five characteristics that serve as the basic conditions for openness in most contexts. The definition goes into more detail than we have time for here today, but we also maintain a maturity model so people can assess how open they and their teams are according to the principles outlined here. Following the definition are several books that we put together. As we were born from a book, more or less, it makes sense for us to continue that tradition. But this is an unusual sort of book series. We write, develop, and maintain in a truly open and collaborative way. We have a series of core volumes that includes a workbook, which contains both inspirational chapters as well as hands-on exercises that you can use at your workplace or in your community. And then a manual specifically for leaders. The leaders manual even has two editions available. We also maintain a series of guides to specific contexts, like the IT culture and education. And now another volume is in development and on the way. It will cover how to use open principle and practices to enhance distributed remote teamwork. We hope it will be ready for release by the end of the year. We've been saying that we are advocates for open principles and practices in organizations, but what does that actually look like? So far, we covered the principles as part of the open organization definition. How do we turn those principles into practices? And here are some examples you can bring with you already today. Our first example is an exercise in how to open up your decision making. Opening up processes and making them more transparent builds your credibility and enhances trust with team members. It forces you to walk the transparency walk in ways that might challenge your assumptions or even comfort level. Working this way does create additional work, particularly at the beginning of the process, but ultimately this works well for holding managers accountable to team members and it creates more consistency. And once you are ready to start the new improved process or way of working, everyone is already on board. They are familiar with the changes and the implementation will then go much faster. So this exercise is in, it includes four phases. You pick a process, you gather feedback, which includes revising and iterating on the process. You implement and last but not least, reflection after some time has passed. How did it go? Is it more transparent? Is it more effective? Do you need to change or improve something? Now, this and many this exercise and many more are available in the workbook. This book is organized by the principles that you saw on the previous slide, with several chapters in each, each section. 
On the topic of making open decision, I often also talk about making all work visible, which is also the essence of the chapter that I wrote for this book, which you can find under collaboration. Inclusivity is a major building block for openness in your team, project, or organization. And I find it really hard, which is why our next recommendation for today is to do a privilege work exercise with your team. This exercise could be a bit tricky to perform in a remote COVID safe scenario, but it's very powerful if you have the opportunity to gather in a large room. And you will need a large room as you will move around physically during the exercise, and some more than others. The first step is to explain to the group that we all have certain privileges others have not had, and sometimes we don't even notice privileges because they are so ingrained in our culture. In step two, everyone gather, gathers in the one line at one end of the room. You will then read statements, which are included in the book. And depending on if that statement applies to the participants, they take a step forward or sometimes backwards. Also explain that if some statement feels uncomfortable admitting to you, just stand still and wait for the next statement. No one has to move. And once all statements have been read, you most likely have ended up in different places in the room. Take a look around. Then move over to the reflection part of the exercise, where you can have quite insightful and productive conversations on what just happened and why. Over to Brian then. Great, thanks a lot, Jimmy. So that's just two examples of some of the practices uh, that our community uh, puts together and maintains resources for helping uh, teams work uh, more openly and understand uh, openness a little bit better. Um, we welcome participation of all kinds, and this is our invitation to you, to everyone here watching. Uh, please consider joining the project and contributing. Um, these are just a few of the ways, right? You can read and share our work with others in your, in your social circle. Um, you know, just get started at theopenorganization.org. Um, you can connect with the community online if you have questions about uh, open principles in general, or if you have a specific organizational problem that you yourself are, are trying to address. Um, we love challenging questions in this community, so you'll find us all hanging out at uh, theopenorganization.community. Uh, that's our forum, uh, our discourse hub. Uh, you can publish your open organization story with us. We, we maintain uh, still to this day, as we did for, for the last five years, um, a, a dedicated publishing channel at opensource.com, which is the world's largest open source storytelling platform. Um, so you can get your article published there uh, and we can offer uh, editorial assistance and feedback and guidance on getting something published that you've worked on. Um, and Alternatively, you could interview someone and publish your interview, right? We love to conduct interviews with open-minded leaders and managers, folks who are really um, uh, insinuating open uh, processes and principles inside their, their organization. So if you've got a great interview, we publish text and audio interviews uh, at, at opensource.com as well. Um, maybe you like to write longer pieces, right? In that case, you know, as Jimmy mentioned, uh, all our books are open source. They're all Creative Commons licensed, so you can read them, review them, see what's missing, and propose a chapter, right? If something is not in the book that you think it should cover and you can write the chapter, please feel free to pitch a chapter. Um, all those books are available on GitHub, and you can get started uh, at the URL here to, uh, to, to, to check us out and file an issue, whether that issue is about uh, a typo you found or the issue is about a chapter that you think needs to be added. Uh, and of course, always, 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 like any open source project, we always need help translating and localizing our materials, right? We uh, have a really great international community, uh, and, and, but we can always use more folks uh, from different regions all over the world trying to help us localize materials for different contexts. Uh, we really do think that our materials are, are useful in a variety of global contexts, but they're only as useful as people are able to engage with them, right? So we need some help translating. Um, so you'll find us in all the places that are listed here. Um, and so please, uh, you know, please reach out, please join us uh, and, and please get involved. We'd love to have you. Jimmy, I'll turn it over to you to wrap us up. Yeah. And uh, thank you all for listening. And uh, thank you, Google, for sponsoring this community uh, track as well. 
And we hope we have got some more information on what we are about working on and more importantly, how to get involved or in contact with us. We are available at the different locations listed before. And if any questions or thoughts pop up, don't hesitate to reach out to us even here in the Q&A or later on by email, Twitter, or any other channel. We love welcoming new contributors and answering questions about ORPA and organizations. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Jimmy and Brian. Um, I think we still technically have a few minutes left on the clock before the close of the session. So I encourage any of the attendees to put questions in the QA or in the chat. We are We'll hang around until the close of the session. Uh, so please let us know if you have questions, but thank you so much, Brian and Jimmy for that talk. It was very inspiring learning about this project and organization. Um, I have a personal interest in this topic. I spent the first half of my career studying how to build technology systems as a forester analyst and now working in open source, it's more about how we build and how we come together and figure out how to work in, in this style and this open organizational model. So really interesting to hear how different groups like this project are coming together to help provide more clarity and definition of what that model looks like. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. Looks like we have a question in the chat. Do Brian and Jimmy want to take one of these? Oh, let me take a look. I have to pull up the, the chat. Do we, Jimmy, do you see it? Oh, here we go. Uh, the question is, comes from Alex. Um, how are you able to avoid the privilege walk exercise from turning into something like a corny corporate team building exercise? Because it's clearly an important topic. And so you want to give it, yeah, you know, you don't want to give it short shrift, which, you know, I appreciate that, that question, Alex, as Jimmy already wrote. Um, it's about bringing it up in the right context, right? So not just kind of tacking it on uh, to something else, giving it the, the weight and the, uh, the, the spotlight that it deserves. Uh, and, and really, it's about facilitation. Right, um, the facilitator is key to making it the experience valuable to everyone, which is why in the open organization workbook, we don't just describe like what the ideal scenario would look like, but we offer all the resources that one would need to run the exercise from start to finish, along with some example sort of almost prescripted remarks to kind of give you a sense of things you can say to keep the activity moving uh, and to respond to, to people's questions. Uh, open organization ambassador Laura Hilliger of Greenpeace wrote that exercise and she maintains that exercise for the community. You can read more about it uh, in the workbook. You can read more about it at opensource.com and you can also reach out to our ambassador who loves to run the exercise, has tons of experience running it and I can guarantee there's nothing corny about the way that uh, she runs it. Uh, so if you want uh, a real expert uh, opinion on running it, that's not mine. Uh, Laura is the person to see. Yeah, and I'm not sure why I, why I started typing instead of just talking. <laughs> just, but yeah, I, I agree. It, it could be very awkward if it's a, either a new group or too large a context where people don't know each other. Then that's a bit, you need to read the room before bringing up something like this. But then again, as we pointed out, it's no one has to move. You don't need to push someone if not you should move or something it's uh, clearly it's sensitive and that's why i also mentioned that i think this is really really hard i mean i'm a middle-aged uh, white guy in sweden it's uh, i have so many privileges uh, probably i don't even recognize so i think it's a really eye-opening exercise to do but you need trust between the people of course Thank you, Alex, for the question. Uh, we still have five minutes. And if we have nothing coming through, I, I don't know how Jimmy and Brian feel about sticking around for five more minutes, but I'll, I'll be here. Sure. Happy to. Yeah, we deliberately wanted to leave time for questions uh, so we could do some Q&A. So happy to, to hang around if folks have extra things they'd like to ask. Great, thank you. I have a non-serious question. I'm really curious if Jimmy's curtain background is a real curtain 
or is that a projection? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm at uh, actually oh. I'm in the office in some of the video conferencing rooms because of the audio and uh, visual. So it's that's why I'm here today. Otherwise, we are mostly working remotely nowadays. It's nice. It's like a studio service now instead of the office mm -hmm. service. <laughs> It is a good, uh, it's a great segue though. If, if while folks, uh, you know, tabulate their questions, I'll, I'll just plug one more time the book that Jimmy mentioned uh, that our community is putting together right now. So if you're interested in the way we make books as an open source community, I encourage you to come to GitHub and uh, our, our GitHub organization and check out our newest book, uh, which is the Open Organization Guide to Distributed Teamwork. You know, as Jimmy mentioned and others are experiencing, uh, you know, teams are working remotely under conditions that some folks have never worked in before, given the, the global pandemic. Um, and, uh, you know, as a community, when, when this started to occur, we kind of got together and said, well, what can we offer to the, the, the conversation, right? And, and we kind of said, well, you know, in some cases, open source communities have been working the way that everybody's being asked to work, you know, fully distributed, remote, globally aware, uh, for decades, in some cases. And so what lessons from open source communities and open source projects can translate into best practices for any organization. Uh, perhaps if your organization is, is, is working openly and just in a distributed and remote way for the first time, how can open principles and, and practices smooth that transition? Uh, and how can working openly um, really make your team much more effective in working in, under those conditions? And so We've got some great chapters uh, already in production. Uh, the book is really turning out well. Jimmy, of course, has a, a great chapter in there too about sharing and visualizing work. Uh, and I encourage you to, to check it out uh, on GitHub, uh, visit us and, and propose your own chapter. If you or your organization has had an interesting experience, uh, please uh, please join and, and, and contribute it. Thanks, Brian. I, I definitely feel that constant distribution now. <laughs> Everything, every, all the way that we are working is virtually and distributed. And there, I know that this is not maybe more or less natural to those that are already engaged, but I think we can all learn from that in the corporate space as well. Um, at least I know I, I work at Google and we have pretty good in enablement of work from home, but there's still that, that lack of community and connection that I think we've had to try to recreate virtually, which has been an interesting discovery process. So I think we can learn a lot from how we were able to organically help with community and connection in these virtual channels already established and open source. So I think that's at least one of the areas that I, I've been interested in learning from, um, knowing that Technology is just part of the problem. It's really how do we connect with each other um, and learn how to work and, and respect each other in this new type of format. <laughs>